Hello, I'm Dr. Younger. I'm director of the Neuroinflammation, Pain, and Fatigue Laboratory. We have new results on a possible treatment for MECFS, or myalgic encephalomyelitis chronic fatigue syndrome, and the treatment is called oxaloacetate. So let's take a look at this new paper and see if oxaloacetate is something worth trying. So this paper was published very recently in the Frontiers of Neurology, and it was written by a team with some longtime MECFS clinicians and researchers, including colleagues of mine, Suzanne Vernon and Cindy Bateman. The name of the study is Restore ME, a RCT of oxalacetate for improving fatigue in patients with myalgic encephalomyelitis chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, this is an open access paper and the link is in the description. So you can download it and you can read the entire paper because I'm only going to be covering a piece of it. Now, this is a clinical trial. So it's testing this potential treatment to improve the symptoms of MECFS. Now, the background or short background is, uh, I, you know, between two and three years ago, probably closer to three, this group published a trial of oxaloacetate for MECFS and it was published and it showed some interesting results. But that study was open label and open label, not open access, it was open label. And open label means it was not placebo controlled. It means that everyone knew they were receiving the active treatment being tested. And we have lower confidence in trials that are open label because the effects, the beneficial effects might be driven by expectancy since everyone knew they were getting the real thing. So this new study in 2024 is a fully randomized control trial or an RCT. I really like proper RCTs. If we look at the hierarchy of evidence right here, we see the RCTs are near the top. So we have the highest or a higher level of confidence in the results. This means that it's reasonable for a physician or other clinician to consider this information when they're deciding on a treatment regimen for their patients. We can have even more confidence that the RCT is really large, like if it has hundreds of participants. Now, this particular one we're talking about today is on the smaller side with about 82 participants. So it's not definitive by itself, but it is an important piece of information that builds upon prior pieces of information to create a compelling story. So first of all, let's talk about oxaloacetate, which I'm going to abbreviate OAA from here going forward. Now, OAA is a chemical that's produced naturally in our bodies. It's also available as a supplement. It's commercially available in the United States, at least, without a prescription. OAA is necessary for survival. You, you cannot live without OAA in your system. It is involved in many core physiological processes in the body. And the most important thing re relevant to today is it's really important for normal energy production in the mitochondria. It's a critical step in what we call the Krebs cycle. And this is a cycle that generates energy for cellular use, which you see right here. And the OAA step is in the red circle. And so the short story is a lack of OAA would cause the Krebs cycle to break down. It would create a failure in this cycle. And as a consequence, there would be underproduction of energy that's required for basic cellular processes. And then those body systems would start to shut down or break down. The first consequences would probably be fatigue and cognitive disruption. And then probably the third one would be inflammation. And then as the cycle continues to break down, the effects would get more and more severe. So the idea of treating this is pretty straightforward. Supply more OAA via the oral route and let it get to the mitochondria so it can provide more AA for the Krebs cycle. And so that energy production is now normalized. Then you have more energy available for your cells, and so your fatigue is reduced, that cognitive reduction is reduced, and the inflammation is probably reduced. So you see an overall improvement throughout the brain and the body. So that's the idea. Uh, now the design. So again, they looked at 82 participants. 
they randomly assign people to receive the OAA, the active treatment, or uh, rice flour, which is their placebo slash control, their non-active capsules. Now, they took uh, 1,000 milligrams of either OAA or the placebo in the morning, and then 1,000 milligrams at night. So they take the capsules twice daily for three months, I believe. And so they got a total of 2,000 milligrams of OAA per day or 2,000 milligrams of the placebo per day for the three-month period. And they did lab visits every 30 days. So let's look at the participant flow chart. So 93 made it through the initial screening. 82 made it to the treatment stage. About half of those were randomized to receive OAA, 42 to be exact. And then 40 people were randomized to receive the placebo slash control. Now, out of the people who were receiving OAA, 37 of those successfully finished the trial. And of the people who received the placebo, 28 of those finished, which means that more people dropped out of the control condition than the active treatment condition. I do need to note that one person in the control condition did die in this study. Um, we're not given full details on that, but there's no indication that that death had anything to do with the placebo control uh, capsules or any involvement with the study. But I do need to note that because it's part of the uh, serious adverse events in the study. Now, the main outcome is fatigue improvement, and this is measured by the Chowder fatigue score. And we can see here that the OAA group, which is the treatment group, they had a 27% reduction of fatigue, which is significant at less than P equals 0 0.001. And the control group right here, they had a 10% reduction of fatigue that was not significant. Now, the main test of interest and the reason we have a control condition is we want to know, and we, we, you can eyeball this and you can see, obviously, the treatment group had better improvements than the control group. That's pretty clear. But we want to know, is, they, is there a statistically significant difference between the two? And so we test the two against each other. And when they did that with the t-test, they found that there wasn't a significant difference between the groups at the classic P equals 0.05 significance level, but it was significant at pretty close 0.057, which uh, are, is often called a trend or almost significant, and the authors do call that a trend. Now, there's very little difference practically between 0.050 and 0.057. That's a a slight change in a single individual could make that kind of difference. However, it does mean that they did not clearly demonstrate the difference between treatment and control as they would have if they had a clear p-value less than p05, and that's clearly due to a smaller sample size. Um, you know, had they had 40 and 40 completing the trial, or if they had 50 and 50, this probably would have been significant, but that's that's part of it. Um, it's one of the risks of having a lower sample size is that you have something that looks pretty strong, but it doesn't reach the this, this statistical threshold. Now, I am curious, uh, this is just, I can't really interpret this. It's more of a curiosity. I do see here that the error bars are non-overlapping, even though the p-value is not significant, and I'm not sure why that's the case. I was assuming these are 95% confidence interval bars, which means if they don't overlap, the statistical test should be significant at less than p05, 0.05, but there, it's not here, and I, I can't really explain that. So I'll reach out to the primary author and try to find out why um, the error bars, why it's not significant, even though the error bars don't overlap. And we, I talked about this last week or the week before that, why the error bars tell you whether it's likely significant or not. So that's the main analysis. Now, they conducted a lot of other analyses, as is typical for a scientific paper. Uh, most of them are too complicated to explain in a video like this. It would take too long, and I would have to explain um, the fundamentals behind those tests. So I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to show one secondary analysis, which is this one right here. And that's looking at the number of 
clinically meaningful responders. And to be a clinically meaningful responder, you had to have at least a 25% or better fatigue reduction. So what they found really quickly is that four out of 10 people who receive OAA had a clinically significant response, and two out of 10 receiving placebo had a clinically significant response. And so basically that's saying that if you receive OAA, you're more likely to have a meaningful reduction of fatigue. Um, that's, the main, that's the main results. Again, there's a lot. If you're interested in seeing the other information, the other tests, do download the paper and take a look and, and you can interpret uh, the other results. Uh, just to note a couple of other things, the side effect profile looked pretty good to me. It looked well tolerated. There was not a big difference between the treatment group and the placebo group overall. So there seems to be some, some evidence of efficacy and some evidence of safety. Now, to raise confidence in the effects, I would have liked to have seen a measure of OAA in the blood. That is doable. You can measure blood levels of OAA. I would love to have seen that at baseline, and I would have loved to have seen that after treatment to see if those people who got better had a increase of OAA levels in their blood. That would help me understand the mechanism of action. And also, if they would have measured OAA at baseline, that might have predicted who was going to respond to the treatment. You might hypothesize that people with really low OAA levels at baseline, those are the people that would benefit the most from OAA. Because, you know, about four out of 10 got a great response, but six out of 10 didn't. Well, maybe those four out of 10 who really responded, it's because they had low OAA at baseline. We don't know, but it's a reasonable hypothesis. And by measuring OAA in the blood, that would also give you an idea of the bioavailability of this treatment they were using. You would expect if you're giving 2,000 milligrams of OAA every day, you would see an increase of OAA in the blood plasma. It would be nice to demonstrate that. Now, they may already be doing that. Uh, I did notice in the design that it appears to be the case that they took blood at every lab visit. And so if they have the plasma, they can run this test. And they may have already done that. They may be preparing that for a secondary paper. I, I don't know. I would also like to see in this paper more information about the specific treatment that's being used. There's a lot of sources of OAA and they range considerably in price. And so I would like to hear more about, is there anything different about this particular product that's being tested in this clinical trial? And especially, does it have demonstrated superior bioavailability or superior efficacy over other OAA options? Uh, last thing I can think of, I would really, I think it's, it's really important to see dosage optimization. They only tested 2,000 milligrams a day. I would like to see more uh, information about lower dosages and higher dosages because you want to find out what dosage gives you the best reduction of symptoms, but you have to balance that against side effects. So you want the best effect with the minimal side effects. So where's that dosage? And especially if the product is really expensive, lower dosage means lower cost. So you don't want to take more than you have to. Now, the OAA that was used was sourced from Terra Biologic, Biological in this paper, and that is a company by the lead author. And so, of course, they had to identify that conflict of interest in the paper. So where do we sit now, given this paper, in terms of recommending it as a treatment? Now, it's not my place, and you'll, you'll hear me say this with any clinical trial, it's not my place as a scientist to recommend any treatment. That's the job of physicians and other clinicians. In terms of science, I would like to see, or before I could really give it my full vote of confidence, I would need to see one more at least larger study. I would love to see like a hundred versus a hundred people study. And I think if that came out with consistent results that, that look the same as this, that would give us a definitive answer about how this will likely work in the overall MECFS 
population. I would love to see that study run by an independent lab group as well, a different group than the ones that ran this study in the earlier open label trial. That's true of any tested treatment. That's nothing specific about this. Again, you'll hear me say that about every treatment. We have the greatest confidence when we see multiple studies supporting the treatment run by multiple different groups. And of all that information, despite the different groups and the different methodologies, it's all pointing to the same answer. When we see that, we have the best confidence that we uh, we can go ahead and recommend this for patients. So that's it. Uh, I'm always, as you can tell, I'm always excited to see more clinical trials. I think it's the most important thing we need to do for ME-CFS right now. So I like to see more trials being conducted. I like seeing more trials being published, and I like seeing more treatment options becoming available for ME-CFS. So I was happy to, to look at this and review it. You know, it if if this if the results of this are reflective of the overall patient population, it looks like that four out of 10 ME-CFS sufferers can gain some benefit from taking this treatment. So I'm going to take a very close eye or keep a very close eye on this treatment approach, and I'll let you know if there are any developments in this area. So I hope that was helpful, and I will be back soon with more uh, treatment and more other general science information on these diseases. Bye.